Welcome to another CO2 Monday. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews. And each week, uh, I'm getting smarter and smarter, to be honest with you. I bring these top guests from around the world that are experts in the field. I really don't have enough time to take as much notes as I want. So I have to go back and watch the webinars and the videos and listen to the podcast to really take more notes because every time there's so much value these guests bring. And today I have a returning guest, Benoit Radier from Simcoe Refrigeration. I met Ben in person for the first time about two weeks ago. It was at Atmosphere America. He did a couple presentations and I was really astonished with his knowledge once again, even after the first time meeting him a few weeks ago, which was really exciting. And we're going to get into how to design and we're going to talk about indirect and direct CO2 systems. I'm super excited about that. Welcome, Ben. How are you doing? Great. How about you, Trevor? And I'm doing so good. I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to do this with me again. And it was really great meeting you a few weeks ago at Atmosphere America. Uh, really learned a lot from those sessions that you did. Yeah, it was quite interesting. A lot of people were attending and it's it's always, always interesting to see how many knowledge are actually sitting in those rooms and people sharing so openly. You don't feel the competitor or trying to hide anything. It's like just sharing and and, and everybody's so passionate about natural refrigeration. Well, that was the subject of the conference, of course, natural refrigeration. Yeah, no, and I really enjoyed it. I made so many connections, uh, networked so many people, got to meet you in person, which is great. And that's what these events are all about. Uh, you need to attend events to start building relationship, talking with the experts, which I did. I did really like one of your talks, and I believe it was the low charge ammonia systems where you got into like district heating, talking about you know net zero communities. Where do you think that is gonna go in the future? Uh, you just you just touch three three very important topics. The first one is low charge ammonia system, uh, which is what has been promote, promoted maybe for the past 10, 15 years. Uh, people are really pushing the envelope on designing those systems. Uh, we know ammonia is one of the best refrigerant and, and we're minimizing the risk and trying to improve the safety of those systems by reducing the charge. This is the first thing. The second thing is, is really harnessing as much as possible the potential of a refrigeration system by capturing all the heat which is produced by the system and return it to the building, the neighbor, or the community to try to make it uh, work to somebody else if we don't use it. And the third thing is district eating. This is another really, really interesting topic. And which, which, what's going on in the world right now, we see how much we are tying to a fossil fuel. We know it has a, a huge impact on the environment. And heat pump is one of the many solutions capable of reducing basically this issue. And finally, having a net zero approach, building community planet is also such a hot topic. Yeah, no, and I've been hearing about it for years and years. And I know when I was with Emerson, Vilter was involved in a bunch of different projects at the time. And it's just something that's so intriguing to me because it's different and stuff that I don't really know about. So that's why I really like your presentation on it. Uh, I'm sure we could talk a whole, whole two hours on it right now, but let's get into straight into like designing and engineering indirect and direct CO2 system to make great ice because I really... I heard this for many years from industrial contractors. My good friend, Jim Dick, who um, worked for Simcoe at one time. He worked with Emerson. I worked with him for a while. And he says the key to making a great ice or the key uh, to find out if you have great ice is talking to the referees, not talking to the players, talking mm -hmm. to the referees because they're non-biased. Because if the hockey players are losing, they're going to say the ice is terrible. But let's get right into... Um, to say, let's do an indirect system. Let's talk about how design that, those. So just to make sure that we start on the playing field for everybody, uh, one of the, one of the things which is crucial to understand between one and the other system 
is the notion, and again, I'm going to be talking about physics and thermodynamic because this is what we're breathing and living with. It's the difference between sensible heat and latent heat. So if I can put that in very simple word, so everybody could really understand, or maybe everybody know the word, but sometimes we get missed, mixed up and we don't remember. So sensible heat is a change in temperature. So as soon as we're talking about changing temperature, this is sensible heat. If we don't change temperature and we provide heat or we remove heat, there's something else that's going to happen, which is a change of phase. And changing phase or changing state mean that we're moving from solid to liquid or liquid to vapor. And when we do refrigeration, Solid do not really travel well into piping. So we prefer to do from liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid. So that's just change of state. Now, when we're changing temperature, the state remain the same. So if we are liquid, we're gonna be liquid all the way up or down when we're changing temperature. And if we're changing state, the temperature remains constant. And I need to put a little parentheses uh, if we are using a NAR 400 uh, type refrigerant, there's going to be a glide, meaning that when it does change phase, there's a change of temperature. And this is something special because it's a mix of two or three different gas and liquid that do not change phase at the same temperature. So now already, we already expanded into two, three topics, but I'm trying to keep it like as forward as, as possible. So normally changing phase, phase, we don't change temperature. Changing temperature, we don't change phase, one or the other. So that being like level up, we're talking about doing a rink floor. It's very simple. It's a concrete floor or a sand floor. There's piping into it. And we are circulating something in the pipe to actually make the sand or the concrete cold enough that when we spray water over and above, it's gonna freeze and create ice. Pretty simple. Now, this, ah. this one of the simplest way to do it, it's using a chiller. When we say a chiller, it is a refrigeration system that's gonna cool down the liquid and we're pumping the liquid into that series of pipe underneath the floor and we are freezing the floor. Now, again, I just mentioned liquid. So when I said liquid, that means that we're sending a liquid at a certain temperature. It's cooling down the floor. So when it's cooling down the floor, it's warming it up and it's coming back to the chiller and then the chiller cooling, cool it down again. And it's a continuous loop like that. So this is called an indirect floor because we have the refrigeration system and the refrigerant stays within the system. And then we're cooling down the liquid, which is going in the floor. We cannot use water because water has a very bad tendency to freeze at 32. So we're using something which do freeze lower than 32. It could be a mix of ethylene glycol, could be a mix of salt and water, which we call brine, calcium chloride brine. And the percentage is gonna be decided in terms of which temperature we wanna use and to make sure we're far enough from the freezing point that we don't run into issues in the floor. So I have a question on that. Is there one of those better? Is the uh, glycol better than the brine or is there different times you would use the different um, um, liquid or fluid? Trevor, this is an excellent question. Uh, I've been with Simco 22 years, and most of the ring, which are 20, 25, 30 years old, are majorly brine. Okay. Brine is something which is very efficient in terms of heat transfer, and it's pretty easy to do. You just need a couple of bags of, of, of calcium chloride, basically, that you mix with water, you put it in the entire system and you run it. So the price of a charge, the liquid charge of the system is fairly low. Uh, people has discovered that uh, you gotta take care of it. You gotta make sure it's well-maintained and you gotta put some chemicals 
to make sure that you are not rusting or corroding your uh, steel uh, chiller as an example and your steel piping if you are using, using steel piping. The latest tendency or the latest trend has been moving from brine, which does create corrosion, and it's kind of uh, a little bit dirty in the mechanical room, moving towards ethylene glycol, which is slightly cleaner. Slightly. Slightly cleaner. Uh, it does not create uh, corrosion when it's well maintained, but the, uh, the specific heat or the heat transfer is slightly less. And of course, and of course, the price of ethylene glycol in your system is way higher than price. Yeah. Now, yeah. An another good reason to use that is when you start looking at doing your system with a global vision. Mm. And, and maybe I don't want to get into that right now, but when you're going to start thinking about the net zero building, a global vision, and you're, you're starting to mix the two sides of the system, the cold side and the warm side. Well, then you're going to have glycol on the warm side. You're going to have glycol in the cold side. And then you can start playing with that depending on the requirement of your building. If you have a cold floor, which is brine, and if you have a warm hydronic system, which is glycol, then we have an issue. <laughs> yeah, that's that was the next question I was going to ask because a lot of these systems now that, especially the newer ones, you're trying to get the most out of that system. So you only have really one system. So if you want to heat the stands, for example, and having brine in one side and then glycol on the other wouldn't really make sense because you'd be buying more components. It's kind of like today's day with there's so much refrigerants out there that if you could have 10 systems with all different refrigerants, you wouldn't want that. So I can see that that global vision. I really like that you say that this global vision of systems because it's so important to think of the bigger picture. So I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and Trevor, I think we see and we see that too many too many times. Uh, people are designing building and they create silos. So you're gonna have the refrigeration contractor, and we're being told just put in the refrigeration system for the ice. And then you have the plumber and he's being told, just put the hydronic system. And then you have the ventilation guy, which is being told, just put the ventilation system. And then the poor control guy gets in the middle and he's trying to get everything run together. And when there's an issue, guess what happened? Not me, it's the other guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and I, I totally see that at, at multiple sites and it's important whoever's, I guess, I don't know if the consultants take care of that all the time or whoever takes it, but it needs to be more of a, like you say, a global vision and, and coming together, all these different contractors working together to have a system that works together. Yeah, and, and, and think about it, Trevor, in, in an ice rink, you just don't have the ice. You have people sitting in the bleachers, okay? You can have people at the restaurant. You might have a gym next to it. You might have a pool next to it. So some area are in eating demand while the refrigeration system is actually producing cooling for the ice. Well, guess what? We can use what is being produced by the rain to the pool or where people are sitting on the bleachers, an example. And this is why working in silos don't allow the global vision and to make sure that we are benefiting for the, for the energy we're spending and we're just throwing it outside. But again, Trevor, this is a complete other discussion we can have like in a couple of weeks if you want. Yeah, no, we, we will, we will. Yeah, okay, so let's get back into the, into the systems themselves. Yeah, so talking about a, an indirect system, again, uh, it's, it's, we're pumping liquid Let's say we're working with ethylene glycol. We're pumping ethylene glycol to the floor. Uh, it's, it, it, it's cooling down the floor and it's coming back warmer. Now I'm gonna start putting some temperature. So just, just it makes a clear picture for people listening to our, our discussion right now. So typically, typically we're trying to have a floor that's gonna be anywhere. And when I'm talking about the floor, I'm talking about the concrete slab. We're trying to have the slab at around 20 degrees, as an example, 
We're going to try to have the ice temperature around 22 degrees. Normally, hockey players really like the ice at 22 degrees. And in order to achieve that, uh, you need to send the glycol at around 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's coming back at 18. So I'm going to pause right here, and I just want people really to understand what I'm talking about. We're sending glycol at 15. It's, it enters the end of the rink at 15, and it starts picking up heat all the way along the length of the. So it's going from 15, 15.5, 16, 16.5. Then it turns around. It's coming back 17, 17.5, 18, and then it's going back to the chill. Oh, yeah, that make, and that makes sense, right? Because you're picking up that sensible heat. Again, sensible heat, change in temperature, change in temperature. Yeah. And so, so that's a really good point. And would these have headers? I'm assuming they would have headers going out there and you'd have so many sections per, um, per length, per foot, or is it one big continuous loop all the way through back? Uh, no, one big continuous loop wouldn't be... Uh wouldn't do it because of the velocity pressure drop and everything. Uh, there's various approach. Uh, there's some approach which are being done uh, where the header is actually along the side of the rink. Uh, we don't see that very frequently or we don't do it this way. We're going to do it along the, uh, the, uh, the end of the rink. And this is, this is what most of the ring has been constructed with a trench at the end of the ring, and you're gonna add the headers inside that trench. And then depending on, I would say maybe, I would probably the quality of the ring and the response you, you want from the floor, uh, it's gonna be various circuit. Uh, you're gonna be, uh, as an example, each circuit could be three inch center to center, three and a half inch center to center, or four inch center to center as an example and then your pipe is going all the way across all along the way of the ring gets at the end turn around and it's coming back hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah now a new trend is to have actually those headers instead of having them at the trench at the end of the rink uh, we've been putting them in the middle of the ice floor underneath the ice and there's really, really good reason to do that. The first one is we don't need to build a trench. That's the first thing. The second thing, since the headers are not open to the atmosphere and not in a trench, you don't need to isolate them. You don't need to take care of them. They're not going to be corroding. And also, there's a very important aspect, which is safety, meaning that people cannot open the trench cover, fell into it, hurt themselves or something like that. So it's basically, it could be anywhere past the radius of the rink. It could be anywhere underneath the, the ground. It's actually below the concrete slab and it's coming from the side. And after that, we have every tee off basically from the headers serving all their circuit. Exactly the same thing. The only difference, if it's in the middle, is going from the middle all the way to the end, going back to the end and coming back like that. Mm, okay yeah that that makes sense and earlier you said the different type of material you would use would that that would be steel would you ever use copper or stainless steel or anything under the ice what what are the materials you would use you know yeah, traditionally it used to be steel and for the past few years we've been doing with high density poly tube. cool very nice uh very easy to install all the nipples are already fusion well to the headers uh, you just put them underneath the ground. It will never corrode. Uh, the part from the mechanical room all the way to the other, you're using exactly the same thing. It's fusion weld, and you can have them pre-insulated on top of that. Awesome. So everything is in the ground prior to having the general contractor actually pouring all the slabs and all the concrete everywhere. Awesome. Okay, that, that's great. So, so let's get back to it. You said we're sending out 15 degrees, and it's coming back at 18 degrees picking up that sensible heat. What, what is happening now on the chiller side or the, the, the primary side of the system? Well, then you get into the mechanical room and we're going into the equipment, which is called the evaporator. 
And the evaporator is gonna have brine or ethylene glycol on one side, and it's gonna have refrigerant on the other side. Refrigerant is ammonia or CO2, or it could be something else. Uh, of course, we prefer natural refrigerant for many reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's, there's, again, a notion of heat transfer or heat exchange. And in this case, because it's a refrigeration system and because it's refrigerant on the other side, there's going to be one side that's going to be sensible heat, and the other side, the refrigerant side, is going to be a phase change, or it's going to be latent heat. Mm -hmm. But again, we got to keep the temperature in mind. We're leaving 15 degrees, we're coming back 18 degrees, and in order to cool it back from 18 to 15, the refrigerant has to be at a much lower temperature. Yeah. In, or in order to have a decent size evaporator, uh, there's a TD notion get, that, that gets in the equation. Typically, we're working with a 10 degree TD. It could be anything, but typically we're working with 10 degrees. Uh, some people could pretend they can do it with two, three degree TD. I don't know how they do it. I can't imagine the size of their evaporator, but to be decent and have a good heat exchange, uh, the TD is related to the surface to give you basically the, the amount of BDU or the amount of capacity that you need. The chiller itself could be of two type, majorly two type, which are the most popular. The first one is what I call the sausage, a shell and tube heat exchanger. Mm -hmm. And the other one is going to be a plate and frame, uh, whatever is going to be gasketed or a fusion well. Mm -hmm. Uh, typically, the shell and tube has a long, uh, has an history of being capable of lasting for 20, 25, 30 years. We can have steel tubing. Uh, we have a surge drum on top of it when it's flooded, which, which is protecting the compressor. The, the new trend going with a plate and frame heat exchanger, it's a vertical heat exchanger using a stainless steel plate when it's ethylene glycol but we got to go with titanium when we're talking about brine. So yeah. there's, there's a notion of, of price. Uh, we can have a surge drum on top of it when it's flooded to protect the compressor. Now, coming back with those temperature TD, in order to produce 15 degree glycol and have a decent heat exchanger sizing, we're going to be working with 10 degree TD. So that means that the refrigerant on the other side will be evaporating at five degrees. Wow. So that's a lot lower than really what you need to cool that ice. Well, we're yeah, saying we want to send 15 out there. Now we're running all the way down to five. Exactly. So this, this is typical, again, Trevor, okay? It, it, it's only some numbers, what we see normally. Uh, the temperature I'm giving you could change. The design yeah. could change. But let's say the, the, the major, most of the time, this is what we're seeing. Now, what you just point out is, is really good. At the end of the day, in order to maintain 22 degree ice temperature, your compressors are working at five degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so a lot lower, like way lower than-, than... Way, low, way lower, and remember, again, your ice temperature, 15 degree at one end, you're 16.5 at the other end, and you're coming back at 80. So if you're going with a thermometer, an infrared thermometer, and you're checking the ice temperature, you're going to have an, a, a nice surface temperature change all along the way of the ice. <laughs> that, that, they mu skaters must love that. <laughs> Absolutely, because then you pick and choose your side, depending if you're own game or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> okay, so, so now... So that's an indirect system. I, I think there's a, lot, there's a few other components involved, but basically you're, you're taking um, a refrigeration system, you're cooling down a medium, a, a fluid, and you're sending out there and you're coming back. Yes. And that is probably one of the original designs, I'm assuming, of ice rinks, maybe. That's the mo Let's put it that way. This is the most common okay. that we see. That's the most common. This is the most common, yeah. So now we get into direct CO2. What's, what's the biggest difference between the indirect and the direct CO2 system, unless you have more to go on in indirect? Well, before you go to direct CO2, I'm going to go with direct only for now. Okay. 
Okay. Direct system into ice ring has been on the market for many, many, many years, many years. Okay. I personally have seen a direct ammonia system. Okay. Now we know again, ammonia, it's an excellent refrigerant, but it's way better to strictly have it in a mechanical room, self-contained and make sure that it's operated and it's under supervision of dedicated people that know what they're doing. But it, it's been around for many years. Now the second direct system I've seen on many occasions, especially in the United States, is direct R22 system. Mm. Now, I'm sure your next question is, why is that so? And now, why is direct CO2 system so interesting? Is that your question, Trevor? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Now, the main reason, irrelevant if it's ammonia, R22, or CO2, it's again a question of temperature differences. So we're going back to the ice temperature at 22, the concrete floor, which is at 20. And inside that concrete floor, now I have tubing, which is circulating a refrigerant direct into it. No change in temperature, strictly a change in phase, which is at the constant temperature. Hmm. My slab at 20, my refrigerant at 18, coming in at 18 liquid, picking up heat, and it start changing phase, going from liquid to vapor, but it's at 18, 18, 18, 18, turn around, coming back, 18, 18, 18, 18, and eventually go back in the mechanical room at 18. Hmm. So, so now, you have, now you have your compressor running at, 18. Mm, so this doesn't matter if it's like you said, either one of those, as long as it's the refrigerant that is going out there and you're using the phase, uh, the latent heat from the refrigerant, that's where you can keep it more stable. Exactly. Now, a slight difference between ammonia R22 and CO2. Uh, ammonia and R22 are subject to pressure drop. And when you have pressure drop, that means that you're losing a couple of degrees. So if I have 18 in the floor, I'm probably going to be running the compressor maybe at 15, maybe at 16 because of the pressure drop. Mm. When I'm doing that with CO2, and this is one incredible thing with CO2, uh, it doesn't have any pressure drop. No, not real. It does have pressure drop, but because the pressure, the operating pressure are higher than any other refrigerant, a loss in pressure will have such a less impact on the pressure, on the temperature difference than any other refrigerant. Mm. So we know, we know when refrigerant are within the pH diagram, within the curve, pressure and temperature are equivalent, are at the same level, they're horizontal, equivalent. So if we're losing pressure, we are losing temperature. But when you're running a floor, with R22, for example, and you are operating that floor at 25 PSI, 30 PSI, 35 PSI, and you're using, you're losing five PSI between the floor and the mechanical room, you might have lost 2.5 degrees. Mm, yeah. When you're running CO2, you're running your floor at 400 PSI. If you're losing five PSI, you're losing 0.2 degree. Big difference. Exactly. That's a the big difference there. And there, there's probably some other factors too um, with using CO2 compared to ammonia and uh, R22 because you're now you're sending that out to, out to the, I guess, the ice rink itself, which uh, me personally, I don't think uh, ammonia is an unsafe refrigerant. Like I don't work in ammonia, but I work in refrigeration for many, many years. And lots of people talk, oh, well, it's toxic and you can get hurt. Well, you can get hurt with anything. You can walk out your house and you can get hurt. There's no, you know, uh, these are professionals working on these equipment, you know, and uh, I think that's a, a great refrigerant. I learned a lot about it over the last few years. Tell me a little bit more about that and in the change, because there are some direct refrigerant CO2 systems already out there before the CO2 one. So you're saying ammonia and R22 are you seeing start to seeing a change from those refrigerants maybe to CO2 or what are you seeing? 
It's an excellent question. And I'm gonna tell you a story. There's a rink in Ontario, which has a direct ammonia system that I went to visit a couple of years ago. And they were considering changing their floor that was 30 years old, uh, going to a direct, uh, well, they were considering changing their floor for something else. And everything was on the table. An indirect floor was on, the, actually an indirect floor was on the table using an ammonia system and circulating glycol in a brand new floor. And when I met the operator and the city council and everybody, so I told them, I said, okay, you need a new floor because your floor is 40 years old. And uh, tell me a little bit about your floor. Uh, well, it's the best one in the area. Every team wants to play in our ring because we have the best ice. I said, excellent. I said, do you realize that if you're going with an ammonia system and a, a glyco floor, you're no longer gonna be the best ice in the area. And they all look at me and they said, what are you talking about? Well, you're gonna be like everybody else. So maybe you wanna keep the same ice quality and the only way you can do it is by going with another direct floor. Nice. And so, so that, that that's a big difference now because I know we've talked about some other projects, hopefully we'll get into in a little bit, but having quality ice is huge. And that's why everyone wanted to play there. And that's all because it was a direct floor. Is that correct? The quality of ice, I'm not saying you cannot have quality of ice with an indirect floor. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is when you're, when you're using a direct floor, you have less temperature change everywhere on the ice. And because you have less temperature change, you have a better quality of ice. Yeah. No, I also, love it. Also, direct refrigerant, because it's a phase change and we are overfeeding the refrigerant inside the piping, it means that as soon as it's picking up heat, it's going to evaporate instantly. And the internal surface of your tube, which is where your heat transfer is, is, is basically happening, will that vapor will be replu replaced by a liquid instantly and is going to be able to pick up heat right away. So the response in terms of cooling down the floor is way faster than what it is by when you have a liquid and you're warming up the liquid which is circulating in your mm. tube. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you would really, yeah, yeah, your floor is going to cool down faster. And I think that would, that would mean a lot to the people that are maintaining that ice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, so these are, we're just started talking about direct systems, the option of direct systems. We still haven't even got into CO2 direct system. So what are the differences between um, going from that ammonia system that's going out there? I'm sure there's a few safety factors with the direct ammonia systems where you probably have to have like leak detectors around the, the arena, I'm assuming? Well, I, I, as you just said before, every refrigerant needs to be treated with respect, okay? Mm -hmm. Irrelevant if it's ammonia, if it's synthetic refrigerant, CO2 or anything else. Uh, if, if you would be using a refrigerant in a direct floor, you need to respect some of the codes and some of the regulation because it, it, it is an occupied space. Right now, uh, regulation has changed over the course of year. Uh, we wouldn't be able of putting a synthetic, a direct synthetic refrigerant floor today because of the regulation, meaning that the amount of refrigerant within the floor will be over and above the uh, regulation, which is limiting the amount of, of refrigerant into an occupied space. Same thing with ammonia. With CO2, there's also a number which is there that we need to respect but we are capable of doing a direct CO2 floor because the amount which is acceptable is much higher than any other refrigerant. That being said, we still need to be careful. We still need to do a diligent and a good job. We need professional that, that knows exactly what they're doing, especially in welding and installing. You need a refrigerant detector and you need a ventilation system as well. Yeah. And that and that's code. So and that's here here in Canada and in wherever you're at in the world, there there are codes. Hopefully, you should be abiding by these anyway. And if yep. they're not, you should look up other countries that have codes and try to follow them because that's safety for everybody. At the exactly. end of the day, exactly. 
Okay, so let's get into direct CO2 systems because once again, we're gonna, we'll run out of time no <laughs> talking about this. Let's get into direct CO2 systems. What are they all about? How are they designed? Well, now it become, I would say the only available option if you wanna do a direct flow. Okay. That being said, uh, development of CO2 system has been exponential for the past 10 years. Uh, we went from almost non-existing or strictly in supermarket that was in Europe 10 years ago. And right now we can see them all over the world. So that's the first thing. It, again, as I said, direct floor has been around for more than 25, 30 years. Ammonia, R22, and even CO2 system were already done many years ago in Europe. It was an ammonia mechanical room that was actually cooling down CO2 that was pumped into the floor. What has changed is the venue or the invention or the rebirth, should I say, of transcritical CO2 system that now for the first time in history in 2012, the very first rink was done with a transcritical CO2 system and on top of that, it was a direct CO2 floor. And that was the very first time in history that was done. Wow. And that was in the province of Quebec. And that was the very first one. And I just went to see it. I was amazed by what I saw. And a couple of years later, we did another one that was at University Concordia in Montreal. That rink has been running over 30 years with an ammonia and brine or glycol, I don't remember, floor, indirect floor. We change it for a CO2 transcritical system with a direct CO2 floor. And within the very first week of operation, uh, the owner saw the difference right away. The saving in energy was so obvious after five months of operation, they save over 300,000 kilowatt hour wow. within five months. Wow. And, and the ice quality is out of this world. I love that. And uh, that, that's proving that, you know, CO2 is a, a player in the refrigeration game. <laughs> you know, just there going from strictly going at one, facility changing from one refrigerant to the next refrigerant and then seeing all this because i've heard this more and more on the, the savings of going with a direct co2 system not only with the quality of ice but the cost of running those large systems in that system were they also doing any heat recovery as well i'm sure we'll get into that a little bit but yeah, it was an existing system. So uh, we, took, we took a portion of the heat reclaim that was returned to the building. And I think the saving on that side was like 40% reduction in their natural gas consumption. And that was only a fraction of what we were producing. Wow. Yeah, I don't know. That's really good. Okay, so let's get back to the system itself. Yeah. Um, so on the... Um, the secondary side, now we'll talk about the primary side. Primary side would be a transcritical side. Yes. Now. So the components I'm assuming that would be there, you'd have your compressors, you go to a separator, from a separator to maybe the heat reclaim. Yes, you so you got, reclaim. You're, gonna have a, you're gonna have a couple of heat reclaim depending on the amount of, of, of loop you wanna add. As, as we know, CO2 can give us uh, many stage of, of temperature when we're going on. Again, it's again it's like sensible or laden. In the case of CO2, it's sensible. So we have a difference in temperature. So typically speaking in ice rink, we're gonna go with two loop of heat reclaim. One that will be for portable water at 160 and the other one that's gonna be for the building at 95. So out of the compressor, oil separator, uh, two series of heat exchanger uh, as heat reclaim going to the gas cooler, and coming back, and then there could be some difference, but to make it really simple, then we come back into what we call a, a recirculator or a pumping unit, which is a big mm -hmm. vessel that's gonna receive all the CO2 in, into that vessel, that's gonna separate the flash gas from the liquid. The liquid will be sitting at the bottom, and right underneath, we have a CO2 pump, which is pumping liquid directly into the floor. Okay. On, on these systems, do they usually have like multiple circulators for backup and stuff like that? 
No, or on one rank, you will only have one recirculator. You could have one, two, or three pump, depending on the size. Okay. It. And normally it would be one pump running and another one standby. Okay, good. So now, so we, we get that back to this big vessel. This big vessel is where all the CO, CO2 would be held. Yes. And so you're saying that after it comes out of the gas cooler, goes through, I guess, some uh, a flash gas bypass valve. Would it be called that, or what would it be called? It'd just be a, a gas valve when you come out of the gas cooler condenser. Yeah, out, of, in... out of the gas out of the gas cooler is that famous flash gas valve, which is okay. actually like uh, decreasing the pressure from high pressure gas and going back, flashing it into flash gas and liquid going into that recirculator. And so in this recirculator, you have, I'm assuming multiple pipes, you'll have that coming in there, the liquid will be dropping to the bottom, and then that will be sent out to the ice surface, I guess, to the header, and then that'll be circulated underneath the ice. Exactly, exactly. And what's coming back from the header, from the return header, is a mix of gas and a bit of liquid coming back into the same recirculator. And again, because of the size of it, gas will be, liquid will be separated from the gas, go back to the bottom and be pumped again. Okay. And at this point, the, one of the difference too is uh, I've heard this many times, those pumps would be a lot smaller for CO2 than a glycol, for, for example. Is that correct? Uh, just, just slightly different. Uh, okay. Typically a ring, depending on the way we do it and the flow we have will be anywhere from 25 horsepower and sometimes on a major oculi could all go all the way up to 40 horsepower as an wow. example in the case of concordia university actually that pump is two kilowatt wow wow big difference <laughs> oh wow yeah okay so so now the big difference between doing that indirect system and that direct system co2 is that you're getting that latent change and you're stabilizing the temperature so now what's happening back at the compressor? We talked about the TD of being 10. We need the ice at uh, the, the glycol at 15. We're running the compressors at five degrees. So what's the difference? What will we be running the compressors at with this direct system? Well, the gas is coming back directly from the floor and it's coming back at 18 and the pressure drops. So we might be losing 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degree. So the compressor, I could safely say that the compressor will be running at 16, 17 easily. Wow. That's a, ma that's a massive difference right there. So instead of running compressors all the way down to five degrees, we're running them at 15, 16 degrees. Yeah. So, so let's say you do, a, you do two rings side by side. One of the rings, you're using a transcritical system that will be using compressor at five. And the other one next to it is a, is a direct system with the same compressor running at 17. So you can imagine that the capacity is not the same. Then you have the glycol pump on one side, which is 25 horsepower. And then you have on the other side, the uh, CO2 direct pump, which is three horsepower. You can see the difference instantly. <laughs> instantly. Yeah, that, I, I, well, I'm excited to go see some of these because that's what I want to do. I kind of want to get an idea of it's always nice to go in person and see in the, so what is the uptake? Cause I've, I'm hearing a lot of benefits of going direct over indirect, but you know, it, indirect is the biggest, biggest ones out there. What's, uh, what's, are you seeing for the uptake on these uh, direct CO2 systems? And I guess they're the only ones that you can really go with now, probably not all parts of the world, but how are you seeing it here? Because I know you guys do a ton of rinks. You do mumps all the time. <laughs> uh, the major difference will be in the uh, in the slab construction. Okay. So an indirect system we can go with high density or low density poly tube that we're laying onto chairs which are connecting to edders and then we pour the slab, the concrete slab over and above that grid of piping. When we want to do a direct CO2 system, we need to use a different type of material. Uh, the very first one we did, we're using copper tubing. But instead of using one inch diameter piping for indirect floor, we're going with half inch copper piping. The very first one was half inch copper piping. 
The other one we did after that, we changed the material. Price of copper started going, rising dramatically. Then we moved from copper to stainless steel. The very first one we did stainless steel was stainless steel coated with plastic to make sure we were protecting that stainless steel where it was touching steel structure like the chairs, the rebar, the wire mesh. And there's also some places where we went with straight stainless steel as piping and the rest of the steel was coated actually to avoid the contact from standard steel with stainless steel. So the uptake basically will be the price of the floor that will be more than a typical poly poly tube piping floor. Yeah, this is what I've talked about with customers for many years, looking at the bigger picture. And I know uh, my good friend Andre Patnode always talked about the total cost, the total life cycle of a system. Because there's lots of customers that think, okay, well, what's the upfront cost? Well, what's the cost? Like, how long do you want this rink to be there or this surface to be there? Only five years or do you want it to be there for 40 years? And when you start thinking the bigger picture, you know, yes, it might cost more upfront to get this new technology, new, new design. But just at the Concordia University that you just talked about, the huge amount of savings in five months. Five months, 300,000 kilowatt hours. So at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, this is $30,000 per year. This is five months, 30,000. So after five years, you're already 150. After 10 years, you're 300,000. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you want these to last a long time, so. Well, a rink, a rink life expectancy for, for a rink uh, using natural refrigerant is anywhere from 30 to 40 years. This is what people are expecting. Mm, wow. So, so that is, uh, that's awesome. You know, and but, it's good. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Do you think they are looking more at the bigger picture when you're designing a rink like the end users or because I know a lot of the stores that I've dealt with over the years are kind of like, well, the smaller ones, I don't know if we're going to be here in 10 years, you know? So are those ice rinks, you know, they're kind of, I guess they're more communities probably. They're kind of looking, okay, we're going to try to make this last the longest. Do you see a difference between commercial to the ice rink side of the you know what, when I think about the last 15 years, community ring were way more open to a global holistic approach, including the entire building and total cost of ownership than some of the very well-known ring. Yeah. And I really like that. I still, I'm going to go back to it, that global view. I love it because with CO2, you're going to be using, you know, the heating, the cooling, and you're going to, you're going to take care of that whole system at a lesser cost than having multiple refrigerants, multiple different fluids to get the same result that costs more money. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I, I actually just got a question in here uh, from from the audience. What is a typical uh, rink floor charge on a direct, uh, on an indirect system compared to a direct system? If we, if we do it CO2 with a gas cooler, we're gonna be total CO2 charge anywhere from 500 pound maybe to 700 pound, you know, depending where the gas cooler is. Uh, if we're going with a direct CO2 system and again it depends on where is it located what's the size of that surge drum where is the gas cooler it's going to be anywhere from 3500 pounds to maybe all the way up to 6000 pounds of co2 okay and this is for a single rink wow but keep one thing in mind one of very prestigious uh, ice stadium has been built with direct CO2 system, which is the speed skating oval for the Olympic in Beijing. So that was done with direct CO2 system. The floor was separated in seven sections. Uh, excuse me, five sections, seven packages, one standby, six running, five recirculator that were connected to those transcritical rack and it was uh, directly connected to CO2 floor, direct CO2 floor. 
and and just for just for the sake of discussion, twelve word speed record were beaten in that bid. Wow, and and that would be all because of the ice, right? The quality of the ice. Or, or, or maybe those skaters were in such a good shape and the food was excellent or it was a direct system on the floor. I love it. I love it. That <laughs> it, it uh, it's so good to talk to someone who really understands it because when I talk to the industrial technicians, they understand ice. And the other, you know, commercial, I'm commercial, I don't understand ice the way industrial techs and industrial professional understand it. And it's good to see that there's a difference between even the, the indirect and the direct systems. And I, and I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. We do have another question here. Um, and they just missed the, missed what you said earlier. Uh, direct ammonia systems in Canada, are they disallowed by code in many jurisdictions? Uh, I'm, I'm not a code person, but if, if you are up, I, I don't think there's any more direct ammonia floor in Canada that I know. The one that were still in use uh, were grandfather claws that were still being capable of running. Today, we would not be allowed to put a direct synthetic floor, neither a direct ammonia floor because of ASHRAE regulation which are restricting the amount of refrigerant that are allowed into occupied space. No, I, I think that answers the question. And yeah. then R22 and some of the other refrigerants aren't allowed in any systems anymore. So just remember that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, this is awesome. I learned so much today. I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to this afterwards. Hopefully you are all taking notes. Those, uh, those papers will be filled because there's just always a bunch of knowledge that I, I get when I talk to you, Benoit, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Any last tips about indirect or direct systems before we get into some questions? Uh, do you want me to share my screen just for a second? I would love to, love you to. Let me just make sure you can. Now yeah, go ahead. Okay, can I right now share it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, there we go. So I just want to show you a couple of pictures of what was done for the Olympic. So you can see this is the ice ribbon. Now remember, it's 400 meter long. Yep. Second, I'm trying to have this. It looks like a nice sheet of ice. Oops. I have the wrong one. Okay, there we go. So this is the ice ribbon. Now you can see this is one of the uh, transcritical packages. So you can see the compressor underneath. You can see the flash tank right on top of it. Now you can see all those packages aligned wow. into the mechanical room. This is another view of that package. And I know it's not super clear, but you can see that this is the entire section of the ice ribbon. And if you closely look, the highest temperature difference that you see from any other places will be 0.5 degrees Celsius. Do you, yeah, th that's amazing. Do you want to hit display settings and change, hit your display settings so it's full screen and go to... Uh... Oh, I can't swap it because I'm. We're just seeing your uh, notes. I know. Let me uh, just so everyone can see it pretty clearly. Yeah. Let me start again. Okay, sorry about that. That's perfect, right there. So now, yeah, we can see it clearly. Here you go, yep. So you see the lowest one is minus 8.33. 
and the highest one will be 7.15 that I can see here. And we can see one, two, three, four, and five section of the floor. Wow, that's pretty consistent within a degree or two. Yeah, and just just in, in order to give you an idea what the pump looks like, 1.5 kilowatt to two kilowatt. Wow. And a typical CO2 floor would look like that. This is the one with copper piping. Okay. And you can see like the copper piping going to the other. And this one was done with stainless steel. Actually, we went with stainless steel tubing half inch in 400 feet roll that we unrolled all the length of the, of the ice ring. And then we bend it at the end of it and we came back to the other. So actually we minimize the amount of welding just by bending the pipe like that. Wow. That's... That, that probably saved a lot of time doing it that way too in big rolls like that. It's not only saving the time, Trevor. It's, it's also a matter of reducing the amount of weld. Yeah. So everything is straight. You get at the end, you just bend it and you're coming back and you have actually half the weld of any other floor you would typically do. Yeah, and, that, and that's huge. And because I get questions all the time, well, CO2 must leak more than because such a high pressure. I'm like no system should leak if we did it right. There leaks happen, you know, rub throughs could possibly happen. But at the end of the day, that's us that caused that. Well, <laughs> it, it's funny that you're mentioning that because we keep on hearing that, and uh, it, it's a buzzword that some people are using because basically they have no argument against you two except, uh, you know, using fear and telling people, you know what, this is terrible. This is high pressure. Well, you know what, Trevor. If you're inflating your car tire at the garage, you know, it could blow up in your face and it's only 50 PSI. Yeah. So CO2 system is running at higher pressure, of course, and any refrigerant system are running at higher pressure than atmospheric pressure. Okay, the difference when we're using a CO2 system is like systems are designed, conceive, we're using materials suitable for that pressure, and this is high pressure welding, which are done by, by you know, high pressure welder using procedures and quality control manual. It's very different than what we heard last week, which is brazing is like gluing steel. Remember that when we heard that last yeah. week? So that yeah. was the most revealing things I ever had heard for so many years that when you're using copper piping and you're brazing it, this is where you see the leak. You know, in an high pressure system using high pressure welding, the weld will not leak. Yeah, no, and I know, like I talk to people, I'm like you ever use or see at a, say a big box store where someone's using a pump jack and they're pumping up a bunch of pallets. The hydraulics in there is, I don't know how many times more than CO2 will ever get, but there's more pressure in there, but nobody thinks about that. Like if that hydraulic line shoots off or you walk beside a transport truck, you yeah. know, just walking beside it, there's, they got hydraulics in there. That's way more higher pressure, but you don't see it or hear about it. So exactly. I, I love it. I love exactly. it. A couple exactly. more questions. Was, we're getting close to the end here. Um, okay. For safety with CO2, we use safety valves up to say 120 bar. What should the piping uh, after the valve to the environment? So copper, stainless steel. I'm, well, not, me ask. I'm not sure I understand the question. Now, what should the piping after the valve? So I'm guessing after the high pressure valve or the bypass valve to the flash tank, maybe should that be, and you can re-ask that question, Dimitrios, but is that, uh, should it be copper or stainless steel going from, I'm assuming from the bypass valve into your flash tank or your separator? Well, we separate the, uh, the high pressure side from the low pressure side. So typically a ring system on the low side will be designed for, if I remember well, uh, don't, don't get me on onto that. I think it's 750 PSI. So it's a low side design. Okay, so I asked the question wrong, sorry. It's uh, the safety lines. So the safety lines going from the machine room outside. 
It has to be high pressure all the way to the outside because on a CO2 system, relief valve needs to be outside. Mm -hmm. So it's a high pressure. So that would be like stainless steel then? Yeah, well, everything is stainless steel on CO2 system. I have another question. Those packages that you showed, were they Simcoe packages? Uh, I'm assuming for the Olympic. No. No, those ones from, were from a European manufacturer. Simcoe was the uh, design consultant on this project, not the provider of equipment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Benoit, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk to us today about CO2. I know I'll have you on here again. I learned so much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for all the great questions, and I will see you all again at the next CO2 Mondays with Trevor. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Bye-bye. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.